Hey guys, today we're going to try something a bit different. I'm going to walk you through a full functional workout routine so that you can see how you might apply some of the concepts we talk about on this channel to your own training. I'm going to blabber through the whole thing to provide tips, observations, commentary, etc. This is a full body routine that will build strength, add size in those aesthetic areas, but also greatly increase functional performance. That means preparing the body for more unpredictable angles. It means increasing strength and endurance so that you don't become exhausted. It means training in those overlooked planes of motion, frontal and rotational. It means training muscles that get overlooked too, such as the rhomboids, forearms and obliques. And it means focusing on real, useful athletic abilities like sprinting, balancing and jumping. I want to demonstrate that you can achieve all of that in a single routine while still providing plenty of stimulus for growth and adaptation. I want to show that functional training in this way is fun, extremely useful and very different from, although not superior to, other forms of training like bodybuilding and powerlifting. If you're a cynic when it comes to the phrase functional training, then I ask you to watch this through and then tell me what you would call it. And to honestly say, this isn't a cool way to train. This program is designed to do all of that in a single routine, addressing the entire body. I also aim to keep the routine short-ish and manageable and to not use any equipment except the jump rope you're seeing here. And that can be substituted for a ton of other stuff. Shadow boxing, skater hops, high knees, star jumps. You can even do jump rope without the rope. That said, I always think you should view the warm-up as part of the workout. So to get started, I'm choosing jump rope as it has a bunch of unique benefits. Not only is it going to get the heart rate elevated and get the blood flowing where we want it, but it's also great for developing timing and coordination. It's also really good for developing ankle stiffness, stiffening those tendons so that we can deliver more power to the ground when sprinting and jumping. Stiff tendons doesn't mean you're immobile. Stiff tendons are a very good thing. Just ask JC Santana, who notes how we transfer forward momentum into the ground via tendons when jumping from a run. It's not about muscle strength. You barely bend your knees in this scenario. It's about rebound. Jump rope can be a little bit harsh on the joints if you're not careful, so do make sure you have a soft surface like this one and make sure you aren't jumping too high as you jump over the rope. Tiny little hops are fine here. Addressing my own form for a moment, I'd say that my arms are outstretched a little bit too far. My elbows should be tucked in more, but this is partly due to the rope being just a tad too long for me. I should have asked for a smaller size, I've come to realize. To be clear, I'm not particularly great at jump rope at all. I don't need to be to get the benefits though. And what's great is that I've been improving steadily just by regularly using this in my warmups. So you'll see here that I go for the full three minutes, only needing to restart a couple of times, something that wouldn't have been the case a year or so ago. Grant has a whole tutorial on jumping rope on this channel. I recommend checking that out if you want to learn more. He's way better than me. I'm doing three minutes of jump rope, which is more than long enough to get the benefits we want, to get the blood flowing, to get the heart rate up, etc. Okay, moving on now to some active stretches. The aim here is to improve mobility and thus help me move better through the actual workout. Each position is held or explored for a minute total. These are active stretches, meaning that I'm not passively relaxing all the way into the stretch or using external assistance to force myself into the deepest positions. Instead, I'm maintaining strength and luring myself into place or bobbing myself up and down in position, undulating and exploring the position. Specifically, this is the type of stretching I recently addressed in my video on the liquid motion system. I hadn't much luck with the static stretches, but I've found that moving around at the end range of motion and just getting used to moving in those places, being able to move in those places, has made a huge difference. I remain relaxed, but I keep it as a strength exercise. For example, in the deep squat position here, I'm moving gently up and down around my sticking point. Of course, getting into a deep squat like this is perfect for improving mobility for the subsequent movements we're going to be doing, like the pistol squat. The resting squat is a position that should feel like a relaxing and natural position to get into. And yet it's one that a lot of people can't hold without falling over or experiencing significant discomfort. This is something we should be aiming to address in pretty much any functional training routine. This does also mean we're getting a slight strength training benefit. And this is where something like the Cossack squat, where I'm moving down to each side, is so beneficial. 
I'm getting a little frontal plane motion here and strengthening the hips. Not in a big way, but just a little way. At this point, I'd like to highlight the shoes I'm wearing. These are Hydra ESCs from Vivo Barefoot, today's sponsors. I've been wearing barefoot shoes for over four years now, almost exclusively. And honestly, I'm not sure I could go back to doing this kind of training without them. Why? Because minimal shoes like these provide you with a wider toe box, allowing the feet to splay and giving you more surface area for balancing and running. You have a smaller heel to toe drop, meaning you aren't forced up on your heels in a position of permanent plantar flexion. That lack of a big heel comes in extremely handy for movements like this, where I'm testing my mobility. If your heel is elevated off the floor, then you won't be getting as much of a stretch in the bottom of the squat, say. You'll be constantly moving in a shortened range of motion. In my opinion, if you can't deep squat barefoot, you can't really deep squat. And another benefit of these shoes, of course, is that you have far greater proprioception and ability to feel the ground underneath your feet. Later in this workout, we'll be doing sprints, and you'll see that this is absolutely crucial at this point. Traditional shoes pretty much invite a twisted ankle otherwise. Vivo Barefoot make my favourite minimal shoes. These shoes in particular are ideal for trail running, but I love them for functional training in general. They dry out quickly, so I'm good to get them wet. They have amazing grip for sprinting, and I think they look pretty badass. All of Vivo Barefoot's shoes are comfortable and beautifully made, and they have a very wide selection. If you're interested, you can get 15% off your purchase by using code THEBIONEER15 at checkout. Use the link in the description down below to find out more. Likewise, these really deep lunges are not only great for stretching out the hip flexors, an area that is tight in nearly anyone who works a desk job, but they're also amazing for strengthening the knee a la knees over toes guy. Once again, I'm just moving around in the area and keeping the muscles engaged. You may have heard that stretching before a workout can actually increase the chance of injury, as you'll lose some of the tension and muscle tone. While this is true, that refers primarily to passive stretches as opposed to this kind of active stretching. And the opposite actually seems to be true for mobility work that involves a strength element like this. And it's also worth noting that we should take this with a pinch of salt, not because it's not true, but because it's a very marginal increased risk that is also highly dependent on the type of stretch and the nature of the training. Athletes were stretching before their workouts and competitions for decades before this research came out, so don't fret too much. It seems sometimes like every time a new study comes out, everyone completely changes their training, throws the baby out with the bathwater. Not that this is at all new at this point. Likewise, I'll be doing one-legged good mornings to develop the hip hinge and make sure that I'm moving through the hip hinge properly when I'm doing leg exercises later on. If you have a light weight, like a kettlebell hanging around, maybe 10 kilograms, you can use this to make the movement a little bit more challenging. Training the hip hinge is one of the trickier challenges of body weight only training. So to perform the single legged bodyweight good morning, basically what you're going to do, you're going to kick one leg slightly back behind you to use as a kickstand and the other one's going to keep nice and straight. And that's the one where we're going to be stretching the hamstring and at the same time we're practicing that hip hinge movement. So focus on moving your buttocks backwards rather than bending at the lower spine. Okay, so now I'm moving to a different spot to work on the shoulders. We're starting with some shoulder openers, whereby I'll be using a tree to get a good overhead stretch for the lats and then out to the side for the pecs. This will improve shoulder mobility, which is great for posture and for pulling off moves like handstands and pike push-ups. And we're gonna be doing pike push-ups later, which makes this a pretty good choice. Make sure that you feel the stretch in the target area while you do this, whether that's the pec or the lats. It's on you to make that mind-muscle connection if you want the stretch to actually work properly. You should feel this in the lats and the pecs respectively. And again, I'm moving through this position and I'm pushing a little bit and I'm trying to lift off the arm, not just staying in one position. I'm training at a nature reserve today to demonstrate that you need no stuff at all to get a functional workout in. You can do it literally anywhere. 
This isn't a fundamental requirement. You can do the same workout in a gym or pretty much anywhere else, but you do get some added benefits from training this way, as we'll see. And now I'm moving into a dead hang. I've made a whole video on hangs. This means we're literally just hanging from the branch or bar, and that's going to get us even more of a pec and lat stretch, open up the shoulder some more, decompress the spine, and even train the grip as a nice added benefit. I'm holding this for about a minute, which isn't too much of a challenge for me. Find a sweet spot with an RPE of about six or seven. I'll be using this term. That means rate of perceived exertion. It's scored out of 10, so in this case, we're using 60 to 70% of maximum effort. As a dead hang, this means you're completely relaxing the body. Other than the grip, of course, it would fall off. That means your shoulders should be up by your ears with no tension at all if possible. My feet are lightly touching the ground, you'll notice. They're not taking any weight off the arms, but what they are doing is allowing my core to relax even more, helping me to get more spinal decompression. That was roughly a 12 minute warm up for a roughly 35 to 40 minute workout total, which isn't a too bad ratio. But that said, if you wanted more mobility and more posture benefits, I might add in a crab reach. So the first exercise is the swan pull. This is a movement from gymnastics training and it's a bit of an unusual one. I might give it its own video in future. While still holding the bar or branch, you're going to pull your body up, but using only your scapula, AKA shoulder blades. Start from the same dead hang position and then depress the shoulder blades, moving them down and retract them, pulling them back. We want to pack the scapula here. You should find that your upper body arches so that your sternum is now pointing up at the sky. And so are your nipples. There are a few ways to do this movement. For example, some people then perform an arched pull up. However, we're just gonna hold for a moment, squeezing those shoulder blades and then lower back to the starting position for a single rep. My arms bend slightly here, but that's not the aim at all. It's just, okay if that happens. Not only is this a great precursor to tougher movements like the front lever, but it's also amazing for your posture. By training the scapular retractors, you'll be counteracting that hunched forwards position that so many of us experience. You can feel this benefit almost as soon as you come down from the bar. Your shoulders will be back and your chest puffed out like a superhero. Of course, this is also a great move for stronger lats and is excellent for training the horizontal pull pattern. For a more detailed description, I highly recommend the channel Movers Odyssey, which has a great breakdown. The video is called The Perfect Hang. That YouTube channel is just a treasure trove of amazing information. I'm doing six reps of these for two sets total. If this movement is too hard, try using body weight rows instead. If it's too easy, try doing more reps of an arch to back pull up, bringing the sternum all the way to touch the bar. Rest between sets for 30 to 90 seconds. This goes for all exercises. 30 seconds if you want a more hypertrophy focus and you don't mind failing to complete your final set. 90 seconds if you're more interested in strength, control and performance. I'm actually going to cut out all of my rest times in this video, partly because that would make for a pretty dull video to watch and this whole full workout thing is an experiment to begin with. And partly that's because my rests were actually all over the place because I had to set up all the cameras and move around with them. Next is a leg exercise, the elevated pistol squat. So go and find a bench or a low wall or a step. Now you're gonna stand on it with one foot, dangle the other foot over the edge, and then lower yourself into the deepest squat position possible before pushing yourself back up again. Training without equipment makes it tricky to get enough of a stimulus for certain areas to grow, legs being key culprits. This is why calisthenics athletes famously have relatively slim legs. But this movement shows that most people should still be able to get plenty of stimulus training without weight. You just have to be a bit more creative. Not only is this a very challenging squat that will really hit the glutes and build a ton of strength, it's also great for training balance and mobility. These barefoot shoes mean we get really deep here, getting a really nice stretch on the glutes and really encouraging growth. And by training single leg strength, we improve athleticism and address imbalances. I'm mixing up the exercises here, rather than focusing on each body part to ensure we get maximum recovery time. We've got some more brutal leg training coming up and training it back to back would make things very challenging. You might even be feeling a little bit sore from some of the mobility stuff if this is new to you. Of course, you're welcome to hold on to something if the balance challenge is a bit too much. 
Try to keep your back as straight as you can as much as possible. I'm getting a little bit of butt wink towards the end of the second set as I'm needing to use more momentum to get through the movement and my form has got a little bit sloppy. Butt wink isn't the end of the world, especially without weight on your back. And for some people, it's going to be an unavoidable result of their anatomy. But it's better to reduce it as much as you're able to. And you can see here that as form breaks down, it does start coming back. If these are too hard for you, you can do bodyweight Bulgarian split squats or just lunges. If they're too easy, do full pistol squats or maybe grab a log to hold. Aim for an 8 RPE. I did two sets of 8. By the way guys, if you are enjoying this type of training, then you might also enjoy my ebook and full training program, Super Functional Training 2.0. While this is a single workout designed to work with no equipment in a short amount of time, that program is a much more detailed routine that works with a variety of equipment, or very little, adapts to any level, and is far more comprehensive in scope for those that want to maximise their performance. It's made from exercises like these ones, but many, many more, and it comes with over two hours of instructional video and an 85 plus page ebook. And if you order quickly, you can benefit from a massive Black Friday week discount. It's just $12 at the moment. I'll put the link down below. Now we're moving on to chin ups. The aim here is to give the lats a little bit more love while simultaneously targeting the biceps. Now this is where you will get a whole bunch of bonus credit if you are training outside like me. I've talked in the past about the huge benefits of training on tree branches. Every tree branch is at a slightly different angle, has slightly different thicknesses, and is slightly different at different points. So one hand might be on a thicker bit and one hand might be on a thinner bit. The result is that I'm using a slightly different combination of muscles every single rep, or at least every single set. This is what I refer to as chaos training, and it transfers better to real world activities like rock climbing, because you're not just pulling in the same precise linear motion, you're building more robust movement patterns, to quote Nikolai Bernstein, and more adaptable fascia. But what really benefits is the grip. Guys, pick a thick branch like this one and you will feel this in your hands at big time. And it translates to greater bicep work too. You get a crazy bicep pump. You know, this train in nature, this chaos training thing, might sound like a gimmick to some. Sure, you say, maybe doing a pull-up from a branch is technically slightly harder but you can't progress it in the same way. It's just gonna mean you learn the pull-up slower. But no, I mean it. Try it and you will rapidly feel the difference. Now tell me that that won't transfer to superior performance. That said, if you do want to do this workout in the gym, then using a pull-up bar will work just fine. I mean, I guess. If this is too hard, try performing the movement assisted with a lower branch, keeping your feet on the ground. Aim for an eight RPE. I did two sets of eight. For reference, I can do about 25 chin-ups on a regular bar in one set. Now we're doing sissy squats. These are serious business for your legs. Only this time, we're primarily targeting the quads. The sissy squat is a squat performed on the balls of the feet where you lean your torso backwards and push your knees forwards. This massively isolates the quads and creates a lot of tension, making it one of the very best ways to develop quads for both appearance and performance. The sissy squat is an advanced move, make no mistake. This is not for those with knee problems. If you have healthy knees, it will make them even stronger as long as you build up to it gradually. Start with a low, low rep range and a small range of motion and build up. You can even start with an easier movement called the Hindu squat. I made a whole video about this one. Or you can do an assisted sissy squat, holding onto a bench or something and helping yourself through the movement with your arms. Even if you're not using the bench as an assist though, I recommend using it for balance whilst you pump out reps. This shouldn't really be used as a balance challenge, not only because that can lead to a nasty accident if you do fall over, but also because the lack of stability in this movement will mean you can't optimally fatigue the target muscles. You need to support yourself if you're training for strength. This way you can use it for all its strength and size building potential and better isolate the target muscles. If you need a harder variation, then you can try one-legged sissy squats, but at this point, I don't even know who you are now. Aim for a seven or an eight RPE. I did two sets of eight. Now we're moving on to the pike push-up. The pike push-up is a push-up with the buttocks elevated, like you're my daughter expecting me to clean her butt and check for threadworm. Starting in an almost downward dog position and then letting the upper body move diagonally downwards to target the shoulders more than a regular push-up would. Try to keep the forearms straight as you lower yourself, forming a triangle as your head moves just in front of them. 
try to keep the torso as straight as you can, hinging at the hips and push through the shoulder blades at the top of the movement, working the traps. This is an excellent exercise for targeting the shoulders that, as we can see, also gives you some trap development. It's also great if you're learning to handstand. The pike push-up is an easy one to progress. Just elevate your legs higher and higher, and eventually you can transition to a full wall-assisted handstand push-up. The same goes for all these exercises, by the way. If you're wondering how to progress, you progress by moving on to harder variations. This should be a lower 7 to 8 RPE. I did two sets of eight. You might be wondering why I'm only doing two sets of each exercise. The answer is that I'm trying to create the most efficient workout possible. While some studies show that three sets are best for growth, the truth is you don't always need them. Not if our primary interest is in functional performance, not if we train with enough intensity, as we see with high intensity training, and not if we're hitting the same area with different moves subsequently. Now it's time for the lizard crawl. This is an exercise I've recently featured in some other videos. It is one of the most bang for your buck movements out there. It's also fun, even if it makes you look a little crazy. Essentially, it's a crawl, as you can see, but you're letting your chest get very close to the ground by moving your arms and legs out more to the side and bending them more. The arms are bent at the elbows like an alligator and your legs come up to the side of your body, giving you some more great hip training and frontal plane movement. I'd like to take this opportunity to apologize for any shots here that are out of focus. Filming such a long movement is tricky, especially when your Osmos Pocket 3 refuses to follow your movement. To be fair, it's actually a brilliant little device that I really love, but it's programmed to track humans, not whatever I look like here. This would be another reason I don't often do this kind of video. Let me know if you like this though, guys. I can certainly do more like it in future. I had fun actually. It's a contralateral movement, this one, meaning that the arms and legs are moving on opposite sides of the body as they do when you walk or run. And this makes it great for developing more coordination. We're going to be rotating the core to get the leg up nice and high on the other side. And that means that it's a much needed movement for the rotational plane. You'll also feel it in the glutes and quads a bit as you push off your feet, especially if you're going uphill. Primarily though, this is an exercise for the pecs, shoulders, triceps, and core. You should be able to feel a really good stretch on the pecs at the bottom of each rep. Really let yourself sink into that. Once again, this is a movement that is slightly different every single time you perform it, making it ideal as a form of chaos training for preparing your body for actual activity outside of the gym. If you'd like to learn more about chaos training, then check out my recent print book, Adaptive Training. Again, being outside massively increases the challenge. Here, I had to contend with going up a slight incline. It's also a great example of strength endurance, and you can progress the exercise with time, speed, or technique. I did two sets of one minute. If this movement is too difficult for you, then some alternatives include push-ups, one-armed push-ups, or regular bear crawls. And finally, I'm ending this workout with a high-intensity cardio finisher, that being sprints or sprint intervals. I just picked two trees that are a good distance apart. I haven't measured them or anything. I'm gonna sprint to one and then walk back and then repeat for a total of five sets. Sprinting is an incredible exercise that does you a ton of good. It's explosive, of course, and it develops lots of fast twitch fiber. You're also training pretty much every muscle in the legs, including the calves, tibialis anterior, glutes, hamstrings, quads, etc. The jump rope we did earlier is also great for the calves, by the way. It's also great for peaking growth hormone. It's common to hear people exclaiming just how muscular sprinters look, despite not lifting lots of weight, and these are the reasons why. Of course, this is great for burning calories and training the cardiovascular system. The heart continues to work hard even as we walk back because it needs to now calm back down. That means you're getting a better cardio workout in less time. I mean, this is a short amount of exercise. It's not gonna burn drastic calories. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. But sprinting is excellent for body recomposition and it certainly doesn't hurt to give it a go a few times a week. On top of all of that, sprinting and running are important skills that are worth building for anyone. You can film yourself, watch it back and work on your form over time. And you'll be increasing explosiveness that will transfer to pretty much all athletic endeavors and it will compound on top of the earlier jump rope. And if you're doing this on grass, you'll once again be benefiting from all that extra stabilization, toughening up your ankles and feet to handle uneven terrain, reducing your likelihood of future injury and becoming much faster over time. What I will say though, 
and this is important, is to be very careful with this. Check the ground where you're going to be running first. Make sure there's no rabbit holes or junk littered there, big sticks. Also, build up to this extremely slowly. I've been doing this sort of stupid stuff for years, but if you twist an ankle running at full speed, it's going to be very painful and you're going to be out of leg training for months or maybe even a year. So be smart. Just like you wouldn't try and bench 150 kilograms on your first day, don't go and sprint on uneven terrain at full speed either, unless you've been doing this kind of thing, unless you're very confident. Just start with a slightly slower run, it's no biggie. It's also generally high impact. So if you're not able to train this way, other easier options include jogging, running a little slower, high knees, lunge walks, or weighted carries. But if you can sprint, sprint. Okay, now to cool down and make sure that all your blood goes back to where it's meant to be. We're just going to walk for a few minutes. You don't need to see me do that. I mean, you know how to walk. If you like this workout and you want to give it a try, I recommend easing into it with some of the easier options I recommended. Aim for two to three times per week and then add in the more difficult exercises as you become more confident. That should be plenty to start getting some results. And if you need more instruction, don't forget you can try out Superfunctional Training 2.0 in the link down below. Let me know what you think about the workout and this kind of content, guys. Thank you so much for watching, and bye for now.